Hello, and welcome to this episode of Curiosity. This is a series where we will explore how to do data differently through conversations with thought leaders and experts from diverse backgrounds. I'm Simone Knight, and I'll be your host along this journey. I'll be joined by Donald Farmer, who each week will meet with new guests to explore the future of data. In a year filled with disruptions at multiple levels, cultural changes are taking place all around us. As a result, developing a high-functioning business culture is something that every executive needs to be focused on right now. In this episode, we hear from leaders who are embracing disruption and discuss the importance of the analytics function being front and center to signal what's going on within the business in order to organize around what's next. As you watch, ask yourself, how can data help us move faster and move together to serve our customers' ever-changing needs? Our journey of curiosity begins now. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Curiosity, our web series of interviews and conversations about the curiouser and curiouser world of data and analytics in the enterprise, in our daily lives, in our rapidly changing complex world. And I'm delighted in this episode to have Jill Deshay and Tom Thomas uh, to join me. And uh, today we're actually, our topic is super interesting one. It's about culture. It's about the culture of analytics, the culture of data, and that sort of role of, of, of data and analytics in, in corporate transformation. So I'm really excited by the topic and by our speakers. Um, Jill, can you introduce yourself? Can you just tell us a bit about yourself and why this topic is relevant to you? Sure. I'm uh, Jill Deshay, and I am by day an independent strategy consultant. And um, on nights and weekends, I run a nonprofit called Out of the Cage that helps rescue at risk shelter dogs. And my background is essentially former management consultant. I had my own firm for 20 years and then former software executive. Um, I worked for a large vendor that uh, acquired my firm. And so I bring a little bit of data, a little bit of analytics, and uh, a lot of culture and strategy to the conversation. Well, that's great. But you're also being very modest. I mean, you've written fantastic books. And uh, one of your books, the, the New IT, is, to my mind, one of the most you know, interesting and compelling books about the, the practical matter of corporate strategy and, and, and digital transformation that I've read. Certainly one I recommend to it to almost every one of my clients at some point. Oh, um, so I'm looking forward to, to hearing more about you know, your insights. And, and, and Tom, uh, tell us about your role. Hi, everyone. I, um, I lead uh, data strategy, business intelligence, and analytics at a company called Ford Direct. Um, and Ford Direct is uh, a joint venture between Ford Motor Company and all of the Ford and Lincoln dealers in North America. We are the primary digital uh, marketing and advertising solutions provider for all those dealers in North America. Um, myself, I have been in business and technology for the last 26 years. Um, was a uh, in management consulting for eight of those years at the beginning, um, and uh, did a stint in uh, mobile applications and telecom, and then moved into advertising about uh, nine years ago, and um, that's where I really started to lead more of the analytics and marketing intelligence side of the business for our clients, um, and then joined Ford Direct um, about uh, six six years now. So um, built that practice up from, you know, roughly two people to almost 40 today. Um, and today we, it, you know, data has become really the center of our um, recent sort of business transformation and where we're going in the future. Um, so I, as a leader in the company, is very responsible for uh, the cultural transformation to become a more data-driven organization. You know, it's fascinating. We, we, we talk about strategy and, and, and digital transformation or, or business transformation, even a cultural transformation. And, and um, let's face it, we talk about it as if it's something we had control over. Um, and yet in the last, what, six months, nine months, um, our business has transformed itself w without our help <laughs> in, in the most dramatic ways, um, probably more quickly, more rapidly, and, um, you know, more directly than, than any transformation we could have foreseen. That's that's very dramatic, 
rather traumatic for, for, for many people as well. But I think there's a lot of positives that we can we can gain from that. Jill, you know, and you, with your experience um, of advising people through very significant strategy changes, what have you seen in the last eight months that have has anything kind of shaken up your view of of, of what's involved? Yeah, I, you know, I you know, I think it's kind of a silver lining of COVID is, uh, you know, really two things. One, I think people, to your point, are embracing disruption much more um, because they've had to. Um, and I think they're also focused. I think, and that's where data comes in more is, is you know, we can't waste time on science experiments anymore. You know, we've, we've got data and we've got new new decisions to make, um, making data all the more critical. So, you know, I, I do think it's a disruptive time and obviously in, in most ways that's bad news. Um, but there is a silver lining, which is that it's forced a lot of people, executives in particular, to embrace change. Right, yeah. And, and Tom, do you see the same thing or do you see anything contrasting to that? No, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the retail channel for um, vehicle purchase and service has been disrupted dramatically because in the end, it's a physical transaction. You know, we're not an e-commerce business, although there's been lots of forays into that, but we're primarily, um, you know, a physically based um Physical, it's a physical transaction, right? So, as different um, you know government orders were put into place across different states, um, there were like roughly three different statuses dealers could have gone into during the crisis, which was completely shut down, or they would be open for business, um, you know, just from a uh, from a sales standpoint digitally, um, or they uh, were open all the way. So we'd have to track you know, the performance of, let's say, um, electronic leads or phone calls or all the shopping activity that we can see that consumers are doing with each of those dealers in different ways based upon the state of those businesses. Um, so it really um, turned the analytics function um, on or put us front and center um, to the business in terms of figuring out what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you um, really want to do something to promote you know, the power of data and analytics inside a company, you know, a, a good old fashioned crisis, you know, really helps because things have changed. People don't rely on the status quo. Their the future becomes uncertain in terms of what consumers are doing. Is it, how's it going to affect sales? How's it going to affect service? Is our dealerships going to stay in business? So people immediately had this um, quest and this enormous thirst to understand what was happening in the real world. And um, we are the ones who were, scrambling to figure out new ways to provide that so that's really very interesting because i hear two different things from you um in in, in the way in which you're describing this and one of them is very um rooted in practice it's it's about the the transformation that may already have happened in some cases about being ready for digital or having gone part way way down the the, the the path to digital or already having you know, a, a kind of full digital practice. But there's also this sense of people wanting to be better informed, which to me is is also cultural. It's about, mm -hmm. so I, I wonder if there's a distinction we can make. And maybe Jill, you know, you've literally written a book on this. So I wonder if you've got a view on this, the distinction between the practice of a business and its culture. But when we talk about business culture, what are we talking about? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting to Tom's point, too. I think a lot of companies have surprised themselves at their own nimbleness, right? And so, you know, when we're, ta you know, when we're talking, you know, good, good and bad, right? I mean, now we have to move. We have to do something differently, you know, and how are we going to do that? Um, and I, you know, I, I think part of the whole data culture thing is, is a new agility. Um, and when we talk about fostering a data culture, it really does come down to being more thoughtful and deliberate about the use of data, you know, in and behalf and on behalf of the company. So it's been really fascinating to see as things shift in our respective marketplaces, how fast we and nimble we are to deal with them. And I think that has everything to do with our existing culture and the evolution of the data culture as we make things happen. I fascinated when you say that some people have discovered themselves to be more nimble than they expected. Yeah. Um, yeah. That is, I, I that, that definitely resonates with me. I've heard that from people, not quite in those terms, but it, it's absolutely right. Tom, have you seen that? What's taken you by surprise about your own culture? Well, I mean, I think part of it's being um, being nimble, but also the willingness sort of to sort of reprioritize tasks, you know, quickly 
you know, to respond to, to what's going on or to what's perceived as a crisis. So, um, you know, I could tell on my own teams that we quickly sort of uh, pushed current activities and current tasks aside you know, or off our plate for the meantime in order to address, you know, what was most important. That is sort of figuring out what our new reality is currently, um, what's happening day to day, and then doing our best to try and predict what was going to happen next. Um, became, you know, really one of the number one tasks um, in, in, in our team, in our organization. Because if you don't quite know how things are changing, it may be that your current activities and strategic initiatives don't make as much sense as they did before the crisis, right? So there, um, you know, the whole company really, we did a bit of a reprioritization of everything we were um, current, we, we currently had budgeted for and had in place. Um, and we kept checking that, you know, every week or every month to make sure that was the right priority activities to work on for the remainder of the year, given what was going on in the crisis. And at first we thought we were going to have to change uh, or reprioritize a lot more than we, we ended up having to. Um, and then we basically, you know, through the data we saw from the customer, started to realize that we didn't have to change so much, right? The customers were still figuring out ways to purchase vehicles, to get their vehicles serviced. Um, I think probably, you know, the, the number one thing that was um, keeping them from being out there and, and transacting was whether or not they could physically go into a dealership, you know. So watching those government orders and how the dealers could quickly react to opening back up, um, you know, was the key component. And, you know, then you have the OEM piece to that where, you know, Ford and GM and all the big manufacturers, you know, they went tight quickly. Um, so they, you know, ramped production down, they try to figure out ways to cut costs, you know, to be able to brace themselves for a large, you know, market impact. And so you know, what you see now happening across all the auto industry is um, somewhat of a lack of inventory uh, to meet the demand that's out there. So, you know, measuring like how fast the consumer is adjusting to purchase and then being able to bring the supply to them and time that just right is the big trick right now that the business are trying to figure out. And they can't do that without the data and the analytics that they need. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, when we talk about business culture, we actually very often talk about it internally. It's the culture in t inside the company. It's the, it's the culture within the hierarchy, within the management and so on. Um, I wonder just from what you were saying there about the, the interaction with the customer, our business culture must also be how we interact with people. And part of that needs to be understanding our, our, our customers and the changes in their world, not just the changes in our world, but the changes in theirs. Have you seen, and we don't need to get into kind of specifics of your industry, but are you seeing the, the public, the consumer, as being as agile and adapting to these changes as business has been? Um, I always believe that the customer is quicker at, at, at doing that. Um, one, because, you know, they're, they're a microcosm of a, of what a business is, right? They're an individual, so they can, they can decide to do things much, much more quickly. And, you know, they're, they're not a large company that has to, you know, that's complex. that has to figure out all these different things to change, to meet whatever the customers are doing. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's really up to us uh, as leaders in in analytics organizations and um, business intelligence and things like that to try to be the, the, the quickest at moving and pivoting to sense what the customer's doing so we can bring that back to the company as quickly as possible to make, you know, bigger adjustments. Yeah, so I, I'm just thinking that this is, um, this is actually kind of compelling, that the customer is already sort of agile. Well-structured companies were just strategically prepared to deal with rapidly changing customer demands are probably in a good position to to handle this kind of corp this, this kind of cultural change anyway. Um, Jill, I know you've worked with you know several companies in that kind of space who've who've been very focused on their changing customer environment. Do you see that reflected in their their way of coping with this? Remarkable yeah, crisis. And I love what, what Tom was talking about because we find that, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many clients I've had and I have now that have kind of shed the kind of research and exploratory projects, you know, the AI and ML kind of prototyping and the innovation centers of excellence and all that stuff because 
They've got real world immediate problems to solve that are customer focused. And, you know, the, the thing that I'm seeing is the maturity of the incumbent data foundation is directly proportional to their ability to pivot to this new world of, of COVID, right? So, you know, the fact that they can say, okay, we're gonna table some of these projects in the interest of meeting the market where it is right now. Um, and in order to do that effectively, you know, the companies that succeed and, and are really quickest on the draw are the companies that have that established data foundation, irrespective of what it is, you know, it could be a legacy data warehouse, it could be a data lake, it could be a series of heterogeneous cloud solutions, but the fact that they have their arms around what their data is, where that data is, its accessibility and its value to a current business problem, I think has everything to do with um, the maturity and the effectiveness of a data-driven culture. Gosh, that's really interesting. And in, in one of our earlier kind of conversations in this series, we discussed the idea of confidence and the importance of confidence to the ability to be curious, the, the title of the, the series being Curiosity. And we're saying that confidence is very important to curiosity. And I think you're actually kind of um, underlining that, that if it, in a sense, I, I liked what you said, that it, on a sense, it doesn't matter what that infrastructure is, so long as it's in place and well-governed and well-managed. And I think that's because it gives you the confidence to, 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 uh, to then adapt and to change and, and to handle the changing circumstances. Tom, are you seeing that? Are you seeing that kind of level of confidence? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what Jill said is, is spot on. If you have the right platform in place, to where it can, you know, to where your data can be accessed and then um, analyzed in a flexible manner, right? Um, to change with something like COVID, that's important. But it's also like how long you've had that platform in place as well, because what really gives leaders confidence and to, to understand what's going on is to have enough historical data, let's say historical uh, customer behavior to see that, um, okay, in this difference of what we're seeing right now, how does that compare to the past? And then the most important thing is how that how it's comparing to the past and how it might matter, right? So that you can your your best predictions are based on you know historical activity and historical behavior. And the more history you have, the better predictions you'll be as to determine whether or not what's happening right now really is going to make a difference in the long run, or is it just going to make a difference in the short run? And so I think that really drives um, you know the confidence part, you know, having the right baselines and benchmarks. In, place to do that and so much that depends on time right so that understanding of where you've been where you are now um, gives you some of that kind of confidence for, for, for going forward but if we think of that sort of fairly technical infrastructure that supports that Jill one of the things that you've spoken about and you're in and, and written about in fact is the the difference between a top-down and bottom-up approach to, to culture and I wonder if in these circumstances, any one of these approaches is going to be more effective than the other. Is this something where a top-down culture coming from, from executive fiat, you know, we are going to be this kind of organization, is that better than a kind of bottom-up culture? Or, or is it a question of horses for courses in this case? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think top-down only works if it's strategy driven. I mean, if, if there's a clarity across the executive and, and board of directors ranks on the, where, you, where the company is going and, and what the strategic initiatives are that we can kind of plug data into, then I think top down really works. And even today, you know, in these, in these days of a pandemic and political disruption, I think that that clarity of, you know, overarching corporate direction makes a difference. But executives just, you know, talking the data-driven language is not enough. And I think every executive, I mean, just to turn on CNBC and you'll, you'll hear executives talk about data and analytics all day long, but it doesn't mean that they're doing it well. And it doesn't mean that those efforts are necessarily all that relevant um, as opposed to the bottom up, which I think we're seeing a lot more of as, uh, you know, data foundations mature as skill sets mature, as data specific investments mature, I think there's, it's, 
there's an elasticity of uh, you know people engaging in various data driven projects in a very effective way with a level of support that they may not have had a few years ago when we were relying on those executives to give us budget you know so again i think it does come back to a certain level of maturity um, you know, a certain knowledge of what the de facto platforms and applications are that matter in what we're trying to do as a business. Um, and, you know, I think that again goes back to what we were talking about before about, you know, just corporate agility and being able to move in the direction the market is heading. That's interesting. One of my clients um, that I was talking to very recently um, had a an experience which I think is very relevant to that, which is as they faced the, the pandemic and how they were going to have to kind of refactor their business in dramatic ways, the management came down with what essentially they thought was a newly thought out strategy and said to IT, you know, big changes for you guys. We're going to have to change overnight and do all this. And I, the IT answer basically was, well, we've got this. We didn't see this coming, but we've got it. We understand this. We, you know, we're ready for it. We've had this infrastructure for some time, and yes, we do need to move more rapidly to put it in place, but we understand this. Executives were absolutely astonished, like, wow, wow we thought this was going to be a huge disruption, and you're saying basically, yeah, we've, we've been prepared for it, you know. So, Tom, when we think of the, um, the company culture, the corporate culture, the data culture, could we expand that out a little bit and maybe think about the other aspects of culture around data, around IT? You were talking about, we've talked a little bit about kind of top-down strategy and bottom-up strategy. Are there other elements which are relevant to your role, which are not particularly focused on the technology of data, but more around communication, perhaps, or more around the way in which they, I guess, the ethos of the company has that changed? Is that something which you see as, as, as changing in your world? Or, or are these fundamental values which have carried you through this, this change? Yeah, I think, um, you know, outside the data-driven culture itself, you have to have a sort of foundational culture within the company of employees um, wanting to do their job better, right? So those who are uh, not satisfied with the status quo or the, the rinse and repeat Kind of mentality um, and they want to learn uh, how to think differently when different things come up and so if you don't have that um, then there must be like a concerted decision um, to make this happen right either through from the leadership directly or through strategic a new strategic framework that's very public um, where the leadership needs to agree share and believe in um, a data driven process let's say for for decision making so you can buy self-service BI tools and do things like that. But if the intellectual curiosity among the uh, user base or the employees is not part of the culture, your Tableaus and Domos and Power BIs are just gonna you know, simply collect dust. Right, yeah, yeah. We get a lot of shelfware where there's not that kind of um, culture of curiosity as you were saying. Have, have you seen that, Jill? Have you seen? Yeah, and you know, it, it, it's, it's fascinating to me, some of these different cultures and how they inform what data-driven looks like. Obviously, companies that are big on measurement, I think have a, a greater urgency to develop a data-driven culture than companies that aren't. Um, and there are companies that aren't measurement-driven, believe it or not. Um, you know, we, we always compared when I was a consultant, it was really interesting to, to work with companies that were very engineering driven um, because they would be more kind of data provisioners in a lot of ways than sales driven where, you know, a lot of people were looking at the data, but maybe not necessarily delivering the data. So it's fascinating when you, you know, and, and it, it's tempting to create these labels, but in a lot of cases, they really do inform how people use and, you know, kind of ingest and continue to, to grow their data foundation. So it's, that's a fascinating topic to me. And we used to actually do a lot of these taxonomies to kind of profile not only the cultures of the companies, but the classifications of data consumers within those companies. And um, I, I think that's still a very relevant thing to do for companies that are, are looking at different ways to use data. Um, you know, who are you know, our, our data consumers and, and how do we segment them in a way that we can continue to provide them data in a sustained and meaningful 
and continually relevant way, as opposed to the people who scream the loudest. I mean, this is not a new problem. Some of the ways to solve it are different. You know, it's fascinating the distinction you make between some companies who are not necessarily numbers driven, they're engineering driven or process driven. And then there are some who are very numbers driven who may well be you know, sales organizations. Isn't part of the problem though that sometimes those so-called numbers driven company or data driven companies can almost have a simplistic approach that you know yeah. one or two numbers start to dominate rather than a more sort of sophisticated analysis of, of where we are? Exactly. And we used to call that the counts and amounts culture, right? You know, just <laughs> give me, amounts. just give me the numbers, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways tragic to see what they're missing in terms of data that they could be capturing and using that could be nothing less than strategic differentiators, right? But because they're so focused on the numbers, um, you know, they sacrifice that. So you're absolutely right. Right. Well, I don't want to put you on the spot, Tom, and ask you if you are or are not accounts and amounts uh, kind of culture. But that, that, do you recognize the term? Do you recognize the problem? No, absolutely. I mean, when we, I think when I first started the company and why we were so small is because it was really a, a accounts and you say accounts and amounts uh, type of mentality around, um, you know, around data, right? So it was uh, really bare bones sort of reporting, um, I wouldn't even necessarily call it business intelligence. And they did know at that time that that's, they needed something more robust. So if you think about the sort of the four, you know, evolutionary kind of quadrants of analytics, um, it was all about what happened, right? You know, so it was very descriptive. And then we've been progressing uh, steadily to the more diagnostic side of analytics and as far as like, why did it happen? And so you start to get better and better questions from the users as soon as you start to get them to realize that if you understand why something happens, then you might know, um, you know, uh, what's gonna happen next, right? So then you get into the predictive and then where really a lot of the company is, um, has now adopted this mentality in the culture to figure out um, what to do next. So really, wanting to move into the prescriptive side of things, both from a uh, business intelligence standpoint, but also in a way to where we can feed data, you know, quote unquote, to machines that help enhance um, the products that we sell to our dealers become more intelligent, right? To be more in the moment with the customer and uh, to provide a more personalized experience to get them through the sales funnel more effectively. That's interesting. So much of that culture would have been based on having a model which was you know, useful over several years. The the data has been built up over some time, and there's an expectation that the future looks more or less like the past. So you can project those some of those ideas forward. And now we're in a situation where the present doesn't look anything like the past. Exactly. Mm -mm. It, no. That's got to be tough, isn't it? I mean, how do we how do we adapt to this? I'm thinking of the people out here there who are you know really wanting to be data driven, um, but what do they compare to? Well, exactly, because the leading indicators are changing, right? I mean, the lagging indicators, I mean, you know, um, you know, pity the company that is still relying on all its, you know, historical lagging indicators, because, you know, this, this new world is, you know, kind of introducing indicators that, you know, we never, you know, would have guessed would happen, you know, so it's hilarious to kind of think of, you know, again, it comes back to nimbleness in a way, right? I mean, how ready are we to pivot? You know, and again, you know, it comes back to how mature are we really? I mean, there, there's kind of a new crop. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Um, a lot of uh, people writing about, look, you know, you can't really uh, be data driven until all your users learn how to write regressions in Python, you know, and like, you know, I mean, we're, we're really leaving a lot of potential skills and value on the table when we start thinking that way, right? Um, so it's, it's really uh, it's really interesting because there's a lot of still tribal wisdom out there that can be translated into very, very creative ways to use information. That's interesting. Yeah, that wisdom, which is already there in the organization. I mean, we haven't seen something like this. Um, of course, you know, we don't have that. But there are in, in many organizations similar, somewhat similar situations. I, I was talking to um, a very small business the other day about their um know their plans during COVID and they said well it was no worse than when our warehouse went on fire you know and they lost all their stock and had to start again and so they've they've been through a miniature disaster in a sense and and, and had to recover um, but they were able to make that transition they were actually able to make that translation between what they'd experienced 
and and the current situation and not everybody's capable of doing that but there has to be um, a corporate culture if you like of being able to learn from the experiences uh, that, that we have and that's something that as human beings artificial intelligence systems aren't really very good at what you might call metaphorical thinking they can't learn from a fire and apply it to a pandemic but as human beings we can that's actually one of the things we do we, we, we we're continually creating our own stories and, and i wonder um how much of that is, is actually important to our culture, whether the culture of analytics or co corporate culture in a broader sense, the ability to tell ourselves these stories about who we are, who we're serving and, and what it is we do. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is very industry specific as well. I, I know in the nonprofit world, um, nonprofit companies right now are doing things that they just never thought. I mean, they're, they're talking about digital transformation often for the first time because they have no choice, you know, donation money is thinning. Um, they need to be more efficient and more expedient at things and things that they just thought, well, not us, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we're not digital, we're a nonprofit. I mean, it have, have just gone out the window, you know? So it's, you know, again, it's back to that silver lining of, you know, mandatory change, you know, we have no choice, you know, which is something that we're hearing a lot is, you know, we have no choice, we have to do this. Right. So that, I mean, good news, bad news. Are you hearing this, Tom? You know, the kind of the mandatory change is what's actually driving change. You mean mandatory change in that um, there's no negotiating with a virus? Well, I think that's one way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I think um, there is much more of an interest in you know other aspects, let's say, of the consumer um, than there has been before. So looking to other types of consumer behavior to try and figure out if that's going to translate to car, you know, car purchasing for used cars, new cars, um, auto service, those kinds of activities. You know, there's a lot more interest in what's happening in the economy, what's happening in terms of people's disposable income, you know, what's happening with the you know, government stimulus, you know, um, you know, much you know, it's, it's always been paid attention to, but it's being paid attention to by a much wider, uh, larger number of people and a, a wider variety of people. Like, um, and so at lower levels in the organization, they're, they're thinking about this, like what's, what's going to happen over the next year and a half while there's a, you know, vaccine under development, then what's going to happen after the vaccine's out in place and the virus is taken care of, but you know, what has that done to the business world? Right. So, that's from on the market side. If you think about, you know, what we're thinking about in terms of a business and our costs, you know, immediate, you know, what's obvious to most companies is, is real estate, right? So office footprint, you know, commuting times, where do people work? Where, do, where can we hire from? You know, how do people work from home effectively? Like what are all the cost implications of that? And really looking to um, other companies um, and how they're doing it. So there's this constant, you know, um, evaluation and, and, and um, uh, investigation of what other businesses are doing in terms of those types of costs to try and not reinvent the wheel. But everybody's trying to be a fast follower, of course, as well, right? So um, the need to get that information in an in in almost real-time fashion um, is, is really important. And there isn't anything to look back to. You know, historically, you know, they try to look at the 2007 financial crisis, which systemically, which was a much larger problem in, in the economy than something where, you know, it's clearly destructive and in creating a big impact, but there's this pretty clear light at the end of the tunnel. You can almost timeline. And that's why you don't see right now the stock market, you know, in a free fall or anything like that, because they're able to look with some level of confidence, 10, you know, 12 months out to see that everything's going to be back to normal. Everybody right now is trying to measure pent up demand across all these different products as well. So um, making sure that you're staying efficient as possible through this downturn, but you're also ready to hit the ground running as soon as that demand comes back. Is That's this, such an this interesting perspective. That everybody's trying to get to. That's such an interesting perspective, Dom. I haven't really heard anyone articulate it quite like that. And it's, it's fascinating that I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but Joe was talking about the kind of the wisdom inside an organization um, that can be repurposed here. And, and, and you're, to my mind, talking about something which is more like the wisdom of the industry. 
that we can learn from each other and we can see um, across an entire industry, across an entire horizontal or vertical sector, um, the impact of this and how we might respond and the fact that there's something in the future. Have you seen anything like this, um, Jill, before, this, this sort of wisdom across an industry that helps transformation? Well, actually, it's, it's interesting. I know that um, the restaurant industry nationwide has had to make some changes. And what we're seeing, at least here in LA, and I'm sure this is everywhere, is even some of the, the best restaurant, like fine dining and very, very hip, hard to get into restaurants are now, you know, you know kind of fabricating these little to-go outposts where you can, you know, have your dinner as takeout and have a really nice dinner. Well, it, along with that, um, these restaurants for the first time are mixing cocktails and putting cocktails into go cups. And that's become such a thing. Like, you know, you really cannot have this fantastic meal without having a cocktail, you know, so we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to mix the Manhattan for you, right? Right. Um, mm -hmm. That they want to put that on the ballot to make cocktails to go permanent. And, you know, say what you want about LA. I mean, that is a really refreshing disruption if you ask me. But, you know, I think it, I, but I think it goes to look, you know, we're, here's something that we're good at um, that will bring customers in and keep them coming back, which, which isn't a restaurant specific conversation, right? And we've got a core competency to do this and do this well. So let's make it part of our repertoire and use it to create demand and since it's working so well, let's make it permanent, right? So, yeah, I think that's actually a great example. I know in our, our experience here, we were on the east side of Seattle, and um, the fine dining restaurants here turned out to be the ones which I wouldn't, I don't want to say they're more agile, but they're the ones who transformed most quickly. In the sense that they said, well, why don't we package up meals? And I think perhaps because they already had such a high level investment, you know, why don't we package up meals? Why don't we provide those meals to frontline care workers, for example, provide these meals to nurses and people who are working um, on extended shifts? And then they've, the reaction now is, well, why didn't we do this before? Not just why are we, you know, how do we carry on doing this? How do we make this now part of our model going forward? which was super interesting to me. They don't just see it now as a sort of emergency stopgap to keep their staff busy and to use up, if you like, their, 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 their stock and their resources, but actually see it now as a, as a part of their social commitment going forward, which is, is fascinating. I, I, the big question we all have is, you know, when we think of Tom's 12-month, 24-month horizon, how things, you know, when we get back to normal, is what's that normal going to look like? And we have to ask this question, I think, as data people, is that... Is, has our data culture actually transformed to the extent that the new normal will be very, very different from what we had previously? And even if it's not permanent, um, to your example, Donald, it still enhances the brand, right? So even if we don't pass this cocktail law, you know, we have fond memories of it and, you know, points to those restaurants that gave it a try, right? Let's go back and eat there, you know? So, um, yeah. yeah, so hopefully some of the, these improvements will become entrenched and will just turn out to be better ways of doing business. But even if they're not, um, they weren't a waste of time, you know? No. Yeah, I think it builds a lot of brand equity for those companies that, that were innovative and tried to, um, you know, go the extra mile for the customer, you know, to try and provide as much of the experience that you would have had prior to the pandemic you know, with them um, in these fine dining restaurants that, you know, um, rely on that experience, you know, by being at the restaurant um, and that being so important and that loyalty that they try to drive, we're also the most at risk, right? I mean, the amount of change a fine dining restaurant had to go through versus a Taco Bell that has a drive through or a Starbucks, yeah. I mean, how much change did those, did the fast food businesses have to do? You know, they probably got more business because of the distancing. Um, but I think if they're, uh, those, comp those businesses and uh, restaurants are able to survive through this, you know, they'll have that equity that they built up um, with people who, uh, with a market that was also in crisis, right? You know, everybody's disruptive, everybody's somewhat suffering. And the fact that you have uh, a bar or, or, or a restaurant that will package up those cocktails that you love to go to go to that place and 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 get the drink, they'd still try to get that to you is going to go a long way in everybody's memory. And that's super interesting, isn't it? I mean, the brand is so important just now, and uh, I, I, I've 
the fact that the culture supports the brand, we're probably seeing that more now than we've ever seen. It's been very exposed. Those companies whose brands and cultures um, didn't quite line up, you know, their internal culture doesn't quite support the um, the caring kind of brand that they wanted to present to the world. They've been they've been kind of brutally exposed. And I think this comes back to something very important that um, you know, Jill, I know you've talked about it about the authenticity of culture, how important it is that your corporate culture is is real and actually reflects the true values of the company. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, bringing that back to data for a second, you know, you know, the mantra that I have with one of my clients right now is provision quickly and use deliberately. Right. And I, I, I suspect that we could probably apply that to the cocktails as well. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, again, I, I think that the better they can do that, um, there's a ripple effect to the customer experience. Um, and so, you know, this is a financial services company. So the faster that we can get this new data and use it while, the, you know, at the time of the interaction, um, not only the more likely we are to kind of close a mortgage, for instance, but, um, you know, our, our survey rankings will be better. And, you know, so, you know, and the possibilities are endless there. So, you know, absolutely. I think that, you know, that brand equity is a, is a major component to that and not an, an overlooked one. Well, I guess I kind of need to be the killjoy then in this conversation, but um, what about governance in all of this? I mean, we talk about the, the culture and provision quickly, as you said, is, is a great uh, mantra. I, I like it, but um what about governance? What about the role of data? And I, I have to say it, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a negative aspect to data governance. It's not just about, you know, hey, you know, we've got everything well managed and therefore we can be more confident. There is a chilling effect of data governance, which is, is undoubtedly true. Um, in your case in financial services, I have, surely there's a, there's a governance element to that, which must kind of get in the way of those ambitions. Yeah. Well, I think that the more heavyweight the governance effort, I think the more taxing it is to the organization. And, you know, we've talked about this before, Donald, but we are really seeing a change in some of those early adopter companies getting away from like that big, huge, heavy executive team making governance decisions and, and, and being smaller and, and, and adopting what we call these, you know, governance regimes where, you know, there are the deciders on what the data standards will be for a particular application or use case. Um, and then, you know, you know, others will be informed, but um, I, th I think that makes companies not only more nimble, but it, it gives data governance a, a higher value than it would, you know, at the at the 30,000 foot level, right? So I think, you know, along with some of these changes that are happening to make us, you know, faster on our feet, I think governance continues to change with it and the companies that really understand what ba being data driven means. I'm thinking of, you know, Tom's scenario where he has, you know, he has customers, he has dealers, he has a wide range of, of, of sensitive information. Tom, you know, governance for you, is this, is this an enabler for you or is it actually something which is um, in some ways holding back the agility that you feel you need to have? Well, it can be sort of a, an opposed, you know, force against, a, you know, a highly proficient, you know, data-driven culture. Um, but if you wrap data governance into the culture itself and make it part of the culture, and that is the ability to exploit and um, go after data opportunities, but do it in a smart and a safe and a compliant way, um, I mean, that's really the key, right? So um, it's being, you know, the, you know, the main driver of, of what changes a culture to be more data driven, in my opinion, is the market. Right. There's a market demand out there to do this. Do your customers now need data? You can provide them directly. Do they need a new or better product based on data that you can provide? Um, or do your employees need data to make better decisions that are an obvious benefit um, for your customers, um, especially in the case of a, of a service um, based business? Um, and so it's this race against the competition to do this. So there's a lot of energy and a lot of excitement around, you know, trying to um, shift the culture in this direction. However, you don't have the, uh, the whole company doesn't necessarily understand what it means. They're not, they don't have the experience, you know, in analytics and in data, um, you know, like uh, the IT and analytics team does. 
Um, so if you're not careful, uh, mistakes could be made and um, you can introduce a whole bunch of risk to the company, especially in our case, we are dealing with um, customer data, PII information, and we have to, to go through a lot of vigorous steps and we have all those in place um, to really protect the customer, to protect the dealer as well, because we have the dealer's data also. Um, and but at the same time, it's it's that data that the market also wants us to take, synthesize, and 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 pro provide fuel back to better products and services for those dealers, so they can make a better connection with their customer, right? So it's it's this constant sort of balance again um, that we that we have to play. There's a balance uh, that needs, um, that needs creativity. I mean, this isn't just a technical answer in a sense. There's, there needs to be some kind of creativity in how you bridge that gap. We can, you know, there's data, 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 and there's a set of rules around it, but there's also got to be some creativity about how you interact with the the business and the customers, and in your case, the partners, the dealers. To, to, to and we have a, we have a very good, um, we have a very strong um, and well educated um, legal and compliance team um, in in terms of. Uh, managing data, sharing data, um, all the latest rules out there around CCPA and GDPR and how that's progressing across the country. And so it's, it's key that we're, um, as an IT and analytics organization, are in lockstep with them, um, along with the product organization. And the product organization is really those who are demanding these new features and functionality for their products. Um, and we're the enablers of that. Um, but you have to have you know, the people who understand the laws and rules and all the contractual agreements that we've had in place with dealers um, for years to make sure that there's um, a stage gate, so to speak, um, as we deploy um, new solutions that are data driven. So Jill, I, I, I'm kind of fascinated because I, I know you must have a kind of strong opinion on this about this, this balance between data with all the inevitable responsibilities that we have and processes and the creativity that's needed to respond, to react, and to and to innovate in a crisis like this, is there yeah. is there advice? I mean, how do we do this? Well, I I, I think it starts with um, the capacity for execution, and then works backwards. I mean, I think the extent to which we know what we need to do is the extent to which we can be creative about it. Um, because you do want to avoid that kind of, you know, over brainstorming kind of let's all get in a room and think kind of thing, right? And I think that people that really understand what delivery looks like and what successful delivery looks like are those people who can kind of unwind how they have classically done things and be more creative about how they're going to do them, you know, at, at, at worst, for now, but, you know, at best moving forward, right? We, you know, are these improvements permanent or not? I mean, you know, maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, but right now, you know, we're making changes that again, are, are brand new to us and could be super creative. And those changes actually might stick. That's tremendously practical. I mean, the idea that you, it's, it's the ability to execute that determines your ability to innovate is, is I think, yeah. Um, I think that's an equation that people probably haven't really balanced before. They've thought of innovation as actually being something separate from execution. Innovation is this thing that happens in the lab rather yeah, than exactly. something which we enable in our day-to-day -day business. I, I, I love that. I think that's actually very, that'll come as a relief to a lot of people. Like, hey, we can be uh, yeah, innovative. I hope so. Yeah, because you know what? I mean, it, innovation has classically been about this big idea or this aha moment when in fact, I think it's just a series of small inspirations, right? And I think anybody can have those and actually, you know, drive something new and, new and unique to the business. That's great. I mean, um, Tom, thinking of terms of this, of in terms of innovation, and, and I, I say I, I love Jill's kind of practical focus there, the fact that it's ability to execute that enables innovation. Are you seeing this? Have you, are you seeing real practical innovations emerge from your ability to execute on your business as it is today? Yeah, I think what uh, a lot of the uh, assets that we have gathered or, or, or um, brought to bear and collected even from a data standpoint inside the company that have allowed us to execute on things currently 
um, if you take a look at where else, where, what else those assets could provide, you start to come up with new ideas that are already just sort of there. Um, so there's a whole lot um, that can be done with um, what's currently in place instead of coming up with a brand new idea that you're not capable of. So again, what you're able to execute does really drive um, a, lot of, a lot of innovative ideas. Um, you know, we're very wary or, or leery of, of going out and trying to create something that we've never done before or is, or is not in our current skill set or, or is something that our technology platform can do. So the key is to really stretch what we have as, as far as we can take it. But you have to, you know, ask the question and hold the right sessions to um, to do that exercise. And so I think that's a lot. And I think that's probably what skipped a lot in a lot of organizations is they, instead of, you know, taking what they already have in place and stretching it to the maximum, they jump right over that and try to do something brand new that they don't have a lot of experience or capability to do. A part of that has to be knowing what you have in place. Yeah. In the sense that you, you have to have a good understanding of what your resources are, what your capabilities are. I, I want to come back to Jill a little bit on this because uh, I've seen Jill present on this topic um, about the use of data in nonprofits. And in particular, the nonprofit that she's interested in, which is you know, rescuing shelter dogs. And it was so fascinating to hear her talking about, well, here's the data behind all these decisions that are being made. And here's how we can disrupt those decisions positively by using data. Jill, that was a, an example of a resource that people didn't even know they had, that you were able to transform what they did with that it's a, I mean, to my mind, it's a great example because it's a nonprofit example. It's a, it's a powerful example that people can, can relate to. Um, it must have been really eye-opening to many of the people you spoke to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we keep our own data. So it's fascinating because, you know, the shelters and the, you know, big, you know, nonprofits, you know, have, you know, I guess, cursory data, but they're starting to gather it more because as a result of our data, we've known which dogs are most at risk at shelters, um, which ones will be adopted the, the fastest, which characteristics when we're at a shelter is videoing dogs, um, do we highlight in videos to make those dogs more adoptable? And, you know, the more I talk about kind of this nonprofit rescue work, the more parallels there are to, to business, you know, I mean, you know, I, I hate to think of shelter animals as products and potential as customers, but it's very fascinating to understand how to market a dog in a certain way to a certain segment of potential adopters to increase those dogs' adoptability, you know, so, you know, substitute, you know, dog for product and adopter for customer, you know, and shelter for storefront and shelter website for the emerging channel that's getting the most attention, right? More people than ever are, are seeing dogs online as opposed to visiting facilities that have animals and adopting them. In many cases now, sight unseen, that, that number is staggering during COVID. I just saw this dog online. I made an appointment with the shelter just to come get it. Right, as opposed to going to the shelter, try, spending time with a lot of dogs, you know, you know, seeing them in cages, going home and thinking about it, filling out a paper form, you know, it's fascinating the digital transformation that's that's almost caught up, you know, that shelters and 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 you know, animal rescue organizations are catching up to the rest of the world better late than never. That parallel, though, it's actually not far fetched at all. You know, which dog will be rescued from a shelter isn't so very different from which. You know which car will be taken from the lot, and uh, you know it, it, I noticed, for example, my son bought a car the other day, a new car, and um, he did it mostly over video. They created a personalized video for him, just in the same way as I know you make videos of dogs. Yeah. You know, it's a yeah, it's, a VIN number is a microchip number, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, so so Tom from from dogs to cars and um, and innovation there. I mean, this is a a great example of a resource that people didn't know they had, and I think video is a great example um, and the kind of online work that we are doing and the online work that many people doing. I mean, this must have transformed your work as well. I'm, I'm wondering as we kind of wrap up, is there, it, maybe there's one thing, maybe there's something you've seen, Tom, in the last sort of few months that have made you think again about the work that you do and the kind of value of that transformation. Have you seen anything that's really changed your, changed your mind or given you a new insight? 
I think the crisis has reinforced something we were already, you know, starting to pursue. Um, we, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of data paradigm that I'm focused on and that we're doing as a company as we kind of went through this business transformation uh, a couple of years ago to become a more data centric company is, um, is this is developing more of a customer centric analytic capacity. You know, um, we had for many years collected data on the performance of our products. So we provide uh, full website platforms um, for all 3,200 dealers, right? Um, we provide a digital advertising program for the dealers. We provide a lead management um, program from third party lead aggregators. We um, provide direct communications and mail service. And then we have a variety of uh, dealer systems it's like CRM, um, uh, inventory management, vehicle transfer management system. So we are able to see the, you know, the customer interacting, you know, throughout all those different channels. Um, and so we, you know, move from this sort of aggregate BI um, state of mind around each of the products as silos or channels and to, term, to determine how they're performing from the standpoint of making sure they're working well for our dealers and whether or not we need to switch out different, let's say a different website partner or a different advertising partner, you know, to provide the most value for the dealers. Um, but what was really happening as well is we were collecting all this individual information about website visitors and people responding to ads and people coming through the CRM and leads that they were creating. And so, um, you know, we started to stitch uh, all those different customers that were in aggregate in those different data silos into one, you know, very customer centric uh, capability or like a journey, so to speak. So, um, so what we're really trying to do is by optimizing marketing and advertising based on this more holistic view of the customer, we're also able to sort of detect, you know, how their behavior is changing, right? So the crisis, it tells us more in real time what's going on with the customer journeys that's different from back in January or December, right? Um, so this sort of customer centric view um, where we can, we're both looking at known shoppers and, and customers as well as unknown shoppers and then trying to connect them to the chance they are they might be owners is is extremely important so that's really the um the main thing we're trying to do and we think uh even going through something like a pandemic will allow us to adapt more quickly in terms of what the right media mix is for the advertising so right yeah. to say you know yeah and actually right finding, messaging. That, uh, finding that balance is it, it, it in, in such new circumstances must be must be very challenging jill um you know as, as you look back over these you know the eight nine ten months which we've been we've been facing this what, what have you taken away what have you seen that's that sort of perhaps changed the way you think about data and culture in an organization yeah it, it's funny donald um before covid i was talking to a former client of mine who had just joined a new company and you know he kind of said well what should i do you know and i said you know it sounds to me like you need to shake up your plan and he said well you know what if i don't have a plan to shake up and i and i said well you know one shame on you and two congratulations you know green field yippee right um and you know now you know covid has kind of you know, unfortunately, unfortunately done that for us. Right. So, you know, I, I think that that's kind of the lesson that we all need to learn because we don't know when our plans will be shaken up for us. So I think we need to be flexible enough to keep looking at, you know, not only what our plans are, but how we're producing those plans and, you know, how they're demonstrating value to our business. And that has everything to do with not only our data culture, and, but our data foundation as well. It's been a fascinating conversation. Um, thank you so much that the this balance between the ability to to have a plan, but to to then change that plan and to do that with a kind of level of confidence is something which has just kind of run through so many of our conversations. But particularly called out in this one where it's it's about the culture that supports this. Um, Tom and Jill, thank you very much. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. And um, I look forward to seeing you in, in person again at some time. But um, thanks very much for all, all the interesting insights. In this episode, we learned that too often, execution and innovation are held separately, where in reality, 
The ability to execute determines your ability to innovate. And today, innovation that goes the extra mile for the customer builds brand equity that will last well beyond a crisis. I encourage you to take a good look at the data that supports your part of the business. Ask why things are the way they are and what needs to be done to make a change. Don't forget to subscribe to the series. You won't want to miss a single episode. Agility and Innovation is up next. I'm Simone Knight. Until next time, stay curious.